One of the most spiritual experiences, an experience that is accessible to all of us, an experience which brings us face to face with God's plan for each and every one of our lives, is when in a restaurant a server fills your glass, brings you your food, and clears your table. In those moments, it does not matter if your server has a headache, is having a bad day, is going through a rough patch in their life because their raison d'etre in that moment is to focus 100% on you and on your needs. And if you have the eyes to see it, in those moments and moments like them, you can catch a glimpse of God's plan for you and your future. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 32, we read that Jesus and the disciples were on the way up to Jerusalem. Now, when Mark says that Jesus and the disciples were going up to Jerusalem, he isn't just being geographically or grammatically correct. He's actually making a point. And the point that he's making is that for Jesus and the disciples, from now on, this journey that they're on is uphill. And straight away, this is a sentiment in the Gospels that you can relate to. Because for a while in your life, things were good, weren't they? For a while, things were pleasant. And then from out of nowhere, suddenly, the terrain of your life shifted and what used to be easy started feeling very much uphill. Things weren't nice anymore. Suddenly they were difficult. That's life. Sometimes it's all right. And sometimes it's just uphill. So given that things are so uphill now, I like very much that Mark takes the time to point out that Jesus knowing very well of how up th uphill things are, look at what it says, is leading the way. And I like this because sometimes in life, you just have to face it. Sometimes in life, things are uphill. Things are hard, right? Here's the reality. Some of us this week are facing things that are difficult. And we're sitting here in church knowing very well that what lies ahead of us in the next five, six days is difficult. And here's the wisdom for you. Tough. <laughs> Tough. That's life. Things get difficult, and you have no choice about that. But you do have a choice about the manner in which you face those difficulties. You can face them with a little bit of belief or with doubt. You can face them with confidence, or you can face them with anxiety. You can face them expecting the best, or you can face them expecting the worst. So I like very much that Jesus, knowing exactly what lies ahead of him at the end of this uphill journey, has the attitude that says, you know what, it doesn't matter. Whether I, I face this with confidence or with, or, with, or with doubt, whether I face this with optimism or negativity, it's still going to be difficult, so I may as well put one foot in front of the other and get on with it. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong knowing very well how difficult this week is going to be getting up tomorrow morning and saying, you know what, just got to get on with it. Just got to push myself and get going and face it and see what happens. Why not? It's surely and certainly better than the alternative. No? No? Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> so then Mark tells us, a little more detail now, that that Jesus says to his friends that when they get where they're going at the end of this very uphill journey, the Son of Man will be, and then pause on the next word, 
betrayed. To the chief priests and teachers of the law, they will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and kill him. Now, this is the third time in just a few short chapters in Mark's story in which, in which Jesus has explicitly spelled out to his followers how it's all going to end. And it's not going to end well. There are simply no good words in this sentence, are there? And when you look at the words in this sentence, you don't just read them. You can remember how many of them felt when those people did what they did to you. Right? You read some of these words and you're there again feeling what you felt when they treated you the way they treated you. When you got that phone call, when you heard that story. And, and, and at the risk of pointing out the obvious, it's never our enemies who betray us, is it? It's always the people from whom we rightly expected better. The people who we were there for. The people who we loved. The people who we cared for. The people for whom we provided. And from out of nowhere they turn on us. And stab us in the back. Or in the front. Doesn't matter. Feels the same. And it's not the pain that they did that pains us. It's who did it. And it cuts us right to the core. And, 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 and Jesus says to his followers ahead of time. This is where it's going. This is how it's all going to feel for you. This is what lies at the end of this uphill journey. And you'll notice to your disappointment that Jesus is careful to use the word we in this sentence. So, so look at it. He doesn't say I'm going uphill to Jerusalem where this is what waits for me. This is a we thing. We are going up here. This was supposed to be the moment in the story in which it dawns on his followers that faith is going to make their lives harder, not easier. Worse and not better. This was supposed to be the moment in which they realized that their fate was enmeshed in Jesus' horrible fate. That the awful verbs that Jesus uses to describe his future are verbs that are also going to be used to describe their future as well. Christianity won't make it better, it will make it worse. And they were supposed to get that at this point. Astonishingly then, we then read in the very next sentence, as soon as Jesus finishes the horrible words of verse 34, in verse 35, James and John. So we're talking now about two of Christianity's brightest and best. We're talking about two disciples who I think have churches named after them in every, every single city, town and village in Christendom. Right, everywhere you go there's a St. James the other or a St. John the other. There's some school. These guys are the best of Christianity. These two, the best and sincerest of the bunch, come to Jesus and say, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, I don't know about you, but I've got a rule. If someone comes to me and says, Darren, I'm going to ask you a question, but before I ask the question, you're not allowed to say no. As a general principle, I say no. First you ask me what you're going to ask me, then I'll decide what my answer is. Jesus, look how he responds. He says... What do you want me to do for you? What do you want? Now for me that's an interesting question given that it appears on the lips of Jesus. Whom we believe is the second person of the Trinity present at the creation of the universe. God in flesh. This is an interesting question on the lips of such a person. Is it not? Uh, this question 
uh, was in my daydreams a little bit this week. If, if Jesus were to ask me this, what would I say? Think about it for a moment. It's Jesus now. Carte blanche. What do you want? What do you want? Anything. Just name it. What do you want? This is the genie in the lamp moment. You can ask anything you want. From the east, the west, the north, the south, anything in the world. Just say it. Name it. What do you want? And the reason I find that question interesting is because, of course, the answer to that question says everything about what we really want. Right? You see where I'm going with that? The values that we say are ours are often completely disconnected from the things we really live for. So we espouse a set of values that may or may not be quite noble and quite decent and quite good and admirable. But what we really live for and what we really want might be completely disconnected from the things we espouse. And this question cuts to the heart of that. What do you want? Your answer tells you the things that are actually important to you right now. Now, what James and John two of Christianity's brightest and best wanted, was, well, they wanted a spread in Hello Magazine. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't read Hello Magazine, obviously. But I, but I know enough about it to know that I hate it. I mean, really hate it. So, You've all seen Hello Magazine, you've flicked through it. It's all, every page is the same, every episode's the same. There's always some person standing like this. I don't know how those people stand. In their $150,000 kitchen. You know, with the big, you know, with the big car and the driveway and the, and the $5,000 dog that's got a better haircut than you do. You know. <laughs> right, you know the drill, and, it, and, and, and every image just says, this is an amazing life, and I've made it. This is what James and John are asking for. Look at the sentence. They say to Jesus, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in glory. The irony in this sentence is palpable. No sooner has Jesus spoken of his and theirs forthcoming suffering than two of his best disciples ask him for a successful, pleasing life. And I don't blame them for trying. Why not? <coughs> better is better. Worse is worse. Why not want better? And this is the first century. It was assumed, ingrained in the cultural world of the first century that being good at religion gave you a better life. And the better you were at saying your prayers and all that stuff, then the more success life would give to you. That was just part of the deal. Look at this next sentence. This comes, um, this comes from a Jewish text called the Talmud. Uh, very interesting because it gives us an insight into the religious world at the time of Jesus. Look at what the Talmud says. When, when, when a rabbi and two of his students, two of his followers, two of his disciples are walking along the road, there should be a pecking order. And you should know by where they're standing what that pecking order is. The most important on the right, the second on the left, and down the pecking order it goes. This is our world too. You should know by looking at the thing someone lives in and the thing someone drives and the digits in a person's bank balance, where they're at in life. You should know how good or bad they are, where their standing is in the, in the pecking order of society. And it's quite natural for the disciples and quite natural for us to wish for more, not less. For better, not worse. Why not? That was their culture. And although Jesus' teaching has up until this point been consistently countercultural. Although Jesus has consistently been saying 
the way everyone else thinks is not the way you are to think. The things everyone else lives for are not the things you are to live for. Although Jesus has been hammering on about sacrifice and about service and about suffering, it seems they have given almost no, no hearing to what Jesus has been saying. And so evidently, as they approach Jerusalem, the royal city in their Jewish minds, they are still thinking that Jesus, as the Jewish Messiah, when he gets there, is going to kick off the kingdom of God. The Romans are going to get thrown out of town. A new era of peace and prosperity is going to be ushered in. And, and there's going to be more and better for everyone. And they naturally want to be at the heart of where the more is and where the better is. They want the best of everything and the first slice of the more. And why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't you? And so when they see what they see in verse 37, they are after the things that you fantasize about in your daydreams, in your winning the lottery fantasies, all that stuff. I don't need to spell it out. Jesus, I imagine, shaking his head at this point, says to them, you don't know what you're asking. You don't even know what you want. And then he says, can you drink the cup I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? Now, in Hebrew tradition, a cup is, is always used as a metaphor to describe a person's destiny. So when Jesus speaks about his cup, is for him to speak about about the destiny that lies ahead of him at the end of this uphill journey. Furthermore, in Jewish symbolism, a cup is often used as a metaphor to describe God's anger, to describe chaos, to describe tragedy. We still use use it like that today. We, uh, um, you know, this is a bitter cup I have to drink. Stuff like that. So what Jesus is saying here is, here's where I'm going. My destiny is uphill, uphill. And it's uphill today and it's going to stay uphill to the last day of my life. And the further uphill I go, the steeper it's going to get. And at the end of the uphill, I'm going to bear all the anger that God has for the sins of you and the world. That's, that's me. And when he talks about a baptism, again in Jewish literature, baptism is used as a symbol. As you know, the word baptism means uh, to be immersed in water. And in the superstitious world of the first century, the water was a place of chaos, a place of destruction, a place of tragedy, a place where, where bad things always happened. And again, Jesus is using this word negatively. Uh, a, a, a baptism of fire lies ahead of me. I'm going to go up this hill and it's going to end terribly. It's going to be worse, not better. It's going to be less, not more. So guys, he says to them, can you do that? Can you drink that cup? Can you go through that baptism? Clearly that question in verse 38 implies a negative answer. However, again failing to grasp the point, James and John say, yes, we can. Yeah, we can do it. You know, we laugh though. But we'll say yes to anything. Thinking that it will give us what we want and take us where we think we ought to go. Sure, I'll do it. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. And we pause too rarely to consider whether or not it's right. Whether or not it's for us. Whether or not it's good. Not every question we should say yes to. Some of the things we think will make our life better won't. It's a waste of time saying that because all, we all say yes, don't we? So they say, yeah, we can do it. Jesus, I imagine again shaking his head at this point. He realizes they're not getting it. So he takes the conversation down three notches to their level and he says, all right, all right. Okay, 
you will drink a cup. You will. And you will go through a baptism. But not the one you're thinking of. You know, the disciples followed Jesus because they wanted a better life. That's obvious. When Peter and James and John and those guys gave up their fishing business, they didn't give up a successful business to have a less successful life. That is inconceivable. They left what was working because they thought Jesus would make things work even better. They wanted a better life and not a single one of them got it. And this is what Jesus is referring to here. He's saying to them, guys, you too have a destiny. You too have a baptism of fire. And for none of you will it be good. So according to legend, James, the person in the story, was beheaded. I've seen Game of Thrones. Not, not good. John, according to legend, was boiled in, 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 in a big cauldron of oil. I've fried fish. You signed up for better. Here's what you're going to get. An uphill journey that ends in screams. Just so you know. It just suddenly occurred to me, probably none of you are glad you came to church today. <laughs> <laughs> At least the seats are comfortable. <coughs> Next sentence. Very weird. He says, but to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Weird sentence. It seems in, in heaven or in the kingdom of God or something like that, there is such a thing as prestige. There is such a thing as, as better than others and all that stuff. But, but, but all of that, Jesus seems to be saying, is mysterious and pre-deciphered. So therefore, the disciples are not to follow Jesus and endure their allotted destiny, however terrible, because it, light, it might lead to success and a better life. They are to follow Jesus and endure their allotted destiny, however terrible, because that's just the path they're on right now. That's just the path life has placed them on. And that just makes sense, friends. We, we waste too much time wishing we were on a different path. Wishing things were different. When it would be so much better if we just got on with it. Just jolly well got up every day and got on with what we have to get on with. And who knows. The wisdom of our grandparents was so much better than the wisdom we get from our therapist today. And just suck it up and get on with it. Anyway, that's where the conversation ends. However, in verse 41, Mark tells us that when the, when the rest of the remaining disciples discover what James and John have been up to behind their back, Mark is cautious to tell us that they all became indignant, by which Mark intends for us to understand that they were all on the same wavelength as James and John. They too had assumed that this journey towards Jerusalem would give each of them a Hello Magazine lifestyle. It would give each of them a life that was better, not worse. And they thought that James and John had gotten some advantage for themselves in talking privately to Jesus. And they were jealous and they were concerned that they might get better things than they did. This was just their culture. And Jesus listens to them arguing about this stuff. And Mark says that he calls them together. Now the word call in this sentence is rarely used in the Gospels. It's a word that describes what your boss does at work when someone in your team screwed up and he pokes his head out of the corner office and says, you five, in here now. Right? That's what the word call means. It's only ever used of Jesus when he's about to say something really angry and stern and important. He says, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. The word authority 
in, in Mark's Greek language means to have control over others. And so in the ancient world, being important was all about controlling others for a purpose. And the purpose was that you would get them to serve your needs. You would get them to spend the, the hours of their day furthering your agenda, supporting you in what you were going through, looking after you in your struggles, making your life better. Right? The concept of importance and prestige in the first century was all about having people in your life who were devoted to your needs, to your ambitions, to your aspirations and your objectives. Sounds nice, right? Jesus rejects this model and says that's how it is in the world. That's, that's what everyone wants. Everyone wants to get, not give. To be served, not serve. To be looked after, not to look after. <coughs> but not so with you. Jesus says, and look carefully at the sentence. Instead. We don't hear the word instead enough. We buy everything that comes to us. In our magazines, our television programs, on our, on, on our Facebook news feed. What, what our culture tells us is important. We buy it. What our culture tells us we should live for, we buy it. We soak up everything and we've forgotten how to think. The word instead is very important. Instead. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of of all. The preeminent value, it seems, of Christianity is not things like success or freedom or deliverance or any of that. It is service. It is, regardless of what you're going through, devoting yourself to the needs the aspirations and the objectives of others. And so I say that one of the most spiritual experiences that you can have is when you go to a restaurant and your server fills your glass, brings your food and clears your table. Because in that moment you get a glimpse of what Jesus says faith is all about. And I say that because of course the language Jesus uses in this sentence is language that in the first century was associated with people who did that very task for a living. Persons whose, whose own needs weren't that important. <clears throat> whose own ambitions, whose own aspirations were always second to them. To the needs and aspirations of others. Jesus is saying to his followers on this uphill journey... Bad news, folks. This is the life I have for you. A life in which you are always second. Did you hear that, you narcissistic people? <laughs> which is every single one of us. Christianity teaches you, you are always second. And I think we've been around church long enough to have heard this stuff before, right? It's good to serve others, and to look after them. I don't know why I'm talking like that. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking like that because that's how it's often said. It's often said as some kind of sloppy, sloppy virtue that doesn't have much teeth to it or much, or much muscle to it. Let us serve others and devote ourselves to others and do good. And we hear that as though it was somehow a virtue that was optional. 
It was a virtue for particularly virtuous people. A virtue that might be applied to people like Mother Teresa or our saintly grandmother or something like that. But in these sentences we learn that it is not a Christian virtue. It is a Christian essential. It is not an optional thing for any Christian. It is a part of every single Christian's Christianity. <coughs> Failure to make yourself second in life puts us outside of the standards of Christianity as, as described by Jesus. It is Christianity's preeminent virtue. Hence Jesus says in the next sentence, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what Jesus teaches about service and self-sacrifice is not simply a principle of Christianity. It is a pattern of his own life. He didn't just teach this stuff, he lived it. And in living it, he compelled each of his followers to live it as well. When we devote ourselves to other people, we are not simply following the teachings of Jesus. We're following in his footsteps. And they're always uphill. Always. Consequently, faith in Jesus, the servant king, that doesn't lead us to a life of service, isn't faith in Jesus. It's something else. And these words of Jesus in this sentence should make all of us, you and me together, have a good, long, hard look at what we're really living for. At what and who is really important to us. What's your daydream? That's always an important question to ask. What's your why? That reveals everything about what you're living for. Is it to add more value to yourself? To have more? To get for yourself a more comfortable life, even though we are all among the most comfortable humans who currently live and who have ever lived on the face of this earth? Is that it? Or is there something deeper, something more noble? <clears throat> we have to go because Infinity Wars is going to kick us out. But Do you know what? Do you know who the worst parents are? It's the selfish ones. Do you like a single person who puts themselves first and you second? Do you like anyone like that? Do you know who the worst lovers are? Selfish ones. The worst friends. The selfish ones. The people for whom it's, it's never about you and always about them. You, you know, you want it to be about you, and, and I get that. We all do. It's human. And when life takes you on an uphill journey, well, then you definitely want it to all be about you. Absolutely. Then of all times, it should be about you. But faith should take you and me in a different direction. Faith should make us good at the uphill. It should make us decent at coping. And it should make us, of all things, profoundly unselfish. Givers, not getters. Often at funerals, particularly the good ones, I quote from Dominic Lapierre's fictional character, Hassani Paul in The City of Joy, where at the end, he says, in life, all that is not given is lost. All that is not given 
is lost. Christianity would push us to be the kind of person who gives much of ourselves, who puts others first and ourselves second, and then, and only then, is ours a life well lived. Thanks for coming. God bless you. And tomorrow morning on the uphill journey, just get on with it. Get out of bed, put on your socks, make your bed, get on with it. You can do that, I can do it, we all can, and God is with us. Amen.